Thank you, Eric. We need a motion to approve the minutes from June. Yes. So second. So um the next just be fair. I think we probably want to take a formal vote on that. Oh yeah, true. All those in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. The um, number three on the agenda is the review and discussion of current BCT operations. So um, as you know, December of last year was kind of the start of our reduction of services and that was due to a staffing shortage. So we're experiencing a shortage of CDL operators. And um, as a result of that, we had to scale back service. Since then we've pivoted some of our uh, what we've been able to provide as far as CDL versus non-CDL. So within our negotiations with the union, we've added a new job classification of non-CDL operators that allows us to hire um, individuals without CDLs to operate vehicles that don't require CDLs like minivans and our smaller cutaway buses. Um, we've also reached an agreement with the union to have part-time vehicle operators, uh, both non-CDL and CDL. And so within that, we've been able to kind of pivot to how we provide service, but it hasn't helped us on the CDL side. So we are having a difficult time attracting and retaining CDL holders um, for a number of different reasons. And so starting with last December, we began making service cuts, particularly on the fixed route CDL side. Per regulation and city resolution, um, any service change that is permanent has to go through what's called a public participation process. And that public participation process, I included resolution nine, uh, from 1995 um, in your packet, resolution 473, was the commission, the city commission's action um, to meet FTA regulation of public participation when there's a service cut reduction or um, fare increase. So if you recall, we did this with the fare increase um, last year in 2022, and FTA considers any change to service that lasts 12 months to be permanent. So while we intended this service reduction to be temporary, we are reaching the 12 month mark where we need to take action and have public participation to formally reduce service. Um, specifically on Saturdays and late night hours. Now, this is a regulatory formality. It isn't a, it isn't a budgetary constraint. It isn't a decision um, that we've come to lightly or that we are choosing to make. It's primarily for regulation and to meet the requirements of the Federal Transit Administration. So what we need as action from the PTC today is um, a motion or a recommendation to the city commission that we eliminate Saturday service. Additionally, we would ask that it's recommended that we eliminate that midnight and late night service. I'm gonna preface that again, we can frame this however we need to, to communicate that this isn't a budgetary decision. This isn't a, um, you know, th this isn't a choice that the city is making. This is already in place, has been in place, we're reaching the 12 month mark and our funding would be in jeopardy if we passed that 12 month mark without taking this action. So if we um, decided to take this action um, and then six months down the line, we do have enough CEO drivers, what would be the process for that? So then at that point, there is no formal process for adding service. We would be able to bring back service as we were able to, and that's our intention. I do think that this gives us the opportunity to 
look at like we've been doing with our non-CDO positions. Um, maybe when we do bring back service, we bring back service on Saturday as demand response only. So only the minivans and cutaways, and we don't focus on fixed route on Saturdays. Um, but right now we don't have the staff to do that. I don't foresee us being able to do that by December 17th. Yes. Mm -hmm. What's what what plan do we have in place to acquire more CDLs? Do we have opportunities to transfer those folks or their interested folks that are non-CDL that might be yes. in getting into it? Okay. Yes. And we're offering some support for that. We are. So we are actually doing all of the CDL training in-house. Excellent. So um, you know, if you were to go to a driving school, that's five to ten thousand dollars, depending on right. the school. Yeah. Um, we are able to train in-house. Uh we do the it's called entry-level driver training program by FMCSA. And then we get them scheduled for their skills test. I would say we have probably a 85% pass rate on that skills test, and then they're able to operate. We've actually had two non-CDL operators shift over to the CDL side. There is a pay rate difference. So there's some incentive there, right? To go from non-CDL to the CDL. Um, all of our positions are safety sensitive. And so safety sensitive means that you are subject to random drug and alcohol testing and pre-employment drug and alcohol screening. Um, that is a barrier to us being able to attract and retain CDL holders. Um, what what drugs are you running into that you're marijuana? Probably the feds that are dictating that. Correct. Yeah, it is a it's a federal uh, DOT Department of Transportation requirement um, for the five drugs that we screen for, um, and THC marijuana is one of those, and that's typically where we see the failures. We've um, We've had some additional failures with uh, like benzos, things like Xanax, Adderall, stuff like that, that are wildly available, but still regulated. Well, whatever we end up doing framing this, um, I just like to have that, that caveat included that, you know, we are, there are opportunities for those who are willing to try out make the investment. Yes. And we, we've, been in discussion about um, attendance incentives and, and things like that that we can do to attract. Um, we've negotiated higher wages with the union. So the pay went up about 8% over last year. Um, anybody with experience, we're now able to bring in at a higher pay rate. So a CDL, a CDL is, is a pretty sought after skill right now. Um, was the 82% of transit agencies in the US have had to cut service because of a CDL shortage. So, I mean, we're not saying somebody who has a CDL has to start back at step zero on the pay scale. We we have room. Um, and the union's been very supportive in that because obviously it benefits them as well. It, they're not being overworked and um, strained. So um, to your point, I think to frame that it's, we are, we're working towards it. It may not come back. Saturday service, for example, may not come back as, fixed route, maybe it starts out as demand response and we see how we can grow that first and then we'll make the decision going forward. Our late night service was always demand response only. Um, at the time, we only had two vehicles operating at midnight. Um, and so we needed to shift that workforce up during the day when there was more ridership and that's how that service decision got made. Um, I would say it's six of one, half a dozen of another on, on what the preference would be to bring back demand response service on either Saturdays or or late night. Mary, is it fair to say too that you've made some progress with your CDL positions, but there are still a few headwinds like folks that are off on medical or family leave. Yes. Folks that are pending retirements. Yes. We then... we know we have a couple of impending retirements. Um, we did receive authority to uh, hire over that amount, cushioning for those. Um, but then that CDL training program is about six weeks long. And then there's about another four weeks of actual revenue service training. So that first six weeks that they're with us is just getting the CDL um, and like the classroom stuff that's required with that. The next four weeks is actually learning bus routes, policies, procedures, fare collection, stuff like that. Um, and so we're, we're looking at a pretty good gap of time from when we hire somebody to when we can actually look at re-implementing service. So we did just have a, a new group come in. There's four of them. Um, we've just had two more interviews this week where we've made offers. 
So we're making progress, but at the same time, we know we have a couple that we're losing. And then we always have various medical leaves or um, injuries that take people out. So two questions. One, um, what's happening with when you have people, have you had any people that have taken the CDL and then taken the CDL and gone someplace else? Yes. And what can we do to prevent that? So we talked about this before. It's difficult for us to enforce that. Um, the cost of pursuing that expense would likely be greater than what we paid. So that $5,000 worth of training that we gave them, it would cost us more than $5,000 in our legal team pursuing that um, when the person something leaves. written up front from them, if you leave, you have to pay this or you have to do this. Our understanding is that it, those those sorts of agreements can be very difficult to enforce. But so if we if we did put it in place, even if we didn't act on it, would that not kind of consciously make these people think, oh, I shouldn't leave because I'm going to have to hire an attorney to get my money back? It's a valid argument, I think. We can discuss that with um, the attorney's office and HR on what an agreement like that. I know there is something similar with PD. Have you um, had one or have you had five that have left with, after taking the training? Um, you know, honestly, we've, we've had probably more than 10. Oh my God. Um, but they've crazy. left for various reasons. Sometimes it's us that, yeah, parts, that makes sense. parts ways with them. Um, sometimes they, they go to school bus. Or they once they actually get on the road on their own, they realize that driving the big bus isn't is not what they thought it was going to be. Okay. Um, and so they leave for that reason. And I'm not real concerned with those examples. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned with using us to get, get their CEO. Getting ten dollars more an hour somewhere else. Yeah. It just seems like we could put something in place, even if it, even if we don't follow through on, on suing them. For it. It still seems like we could plant that in their head that we aren't going. To. Yeah, I will talk. I will follow up with the attorney's office, and I'll see if there's something similar to what PD uses with the academy um, to get that. We're not alone in this. Oh, I'm sure we're. Not. <laughs> I talked to quite a few people at MLO. They're very similar. Yes, and we're all fighting for the same people and you right. you know i guess the difference between us and private uh trucking industry is that we have a limited amount of fun funding that we can throw at the problem um and as far as sign on bonuses and things like that those can't come out of our federal operating funds those would have to come out of the city's general fund um and i'm still not convinced that sign on bonuses would solve the problem um yeah i th i think it's a it's something where it has forced us to think creatively and think outside the box on how we provide service, which is where we've taken advantage of that opportunity to pivot to different types of vehicles that we're ordering and then um, different types of service that we're providing. So even with our most recent service cut with taking fixed route to 3 p.m. instead of 7 p.m., um, just this week, we're up to five vehicles mm -hmm. on the road, five demand response or BC Go vehicles on the road at one time now. Um, to make up for that that gap. Wow, that's great. Mm -hmm. And it, it's been packed. That BC yeah. Go has been packed. Yeah. And Mallory, it, it should be clear too, right? That those service changes aren't really being considered as part of this conversation. Correct. Yep. They, we would not. Yeah. The only action or um, service cuts that would be framed in this are the Saturday service reduction and the midnight service reduction. So we took that midnight, uh, we cut midnight service back to 7 p.m. and then we eliminated Saturday service. That was on December 17th of 2022. Is there such a thing that that you could contract with Uber or, or another company, Lyft or whatever, to pick up any type of slack? Those opportunities exist in cities where those services exist. So because we don't have a presence of Uber and Lyft, um, we're not able to contract those services. So we don't out. have either one in town? Not reliably. No, not it's reliably. very, yeah, very scarce. When they want to 
Yeah. Was there any conversation in my mail about, well, first question, the CDL level um, vehicles, how often, like, what's their typical capacity um, that we're running? Is it, is it usually full, half? A it depends on the time of day and the route. So the fort might be a little bigger than your yep. average. Yep. So for example, we have 40 foot buses, uh, uh, which are 40 seated passengers. Um, those buses run to the fort, especially in the morning um, at full capacity on Southwest Capitol, yeah. the Fort Custer VA in Columbia. Um, so we have three routes that we have dedicated 40 foot buses to. The other buses are 35 foot and those are scattered throughout the other routes. We've used some of that ridership data to determine the service cuts that we most recently made, um, where we alternated hours of service. We chose our least um, dense routes. And then Emmett, for example, our Emmett route uh, had the lowest ridership. And so we put that one as like every second hour. So it only runs about four times a day. Because you hear anecdotal stuff, typically, I, I assume the four, especially, you know, shift change hours. Is Packed. packed yeah but your anecdotal stuff like i see a bus driving by and there's two people on it or something and that just raised a question you know if there were conversations at mml regarding you know is there more of a shift away from larger vehicles that require cdl or is there conversation were there conversations about that the conversation wasn't necessarily there um the conversation was that everyone is seeing issues with getting cdl drivers and so um, like I was talking about BC Go and how we kind of use that to help yeah. us still be able to provide that service. But overall, everyone's just trying to figure out how they can still provide the service. So to your point, yes, there there are other cities that are are doing this. We've actually presented with cities that have that have done this. And I think the grander vision for Battle Creek Transit is that we will change what fixed route looks like over time and shift to smaller, more route appropriate vehicles. Um, it's this concept, it's called microtransit. And so the concept is that we will never likely be able to get away from those VA Fort Custer, Southwest Capital, where it's just more far more efficient to run those big routes. Some values there. Yeah. Yes. But for some of our other routes, we can have feeder service basically on minivans that has virtual bus stops or door-to-door -door style service that connects people to those those fixed routes. And so that's the that's the idea behind the microtransit BC Go demo that we're doing. Most people right now are using it door to door. They're not using it to. We do have a percentage of trips that go to the T Center or are going to like the train train station. Um, but for the most part, people are using BC Go to go straight door to door. But we can add levels of service to it. So for example, um, there are cities who run it as it's free connection. Um, if you use BC Go or their microtransit service to get to a fixed route, then your trip on fixed route is free. Oh, excellent. So it incentivizes oh, yeah. using the fixed route service. Yeah. Get away from the rigidity of the CDL operator. Yes. Excellent. Is, is, would this be the time to uh, include elimination of service for Emmett or Plain, uh, Penfield? I wouldn't recommend doing that right now. The PTC could can take action to recommend anything to the commission. I wouldn't recommend reducing our service area or changing our service area at this time. And we're not required to address that right now. I understand that, mm -hmm. but you know, they don't have any interest in joining tax. So why are we, why are we servicing them? We know that our residents want to go to, for example, Walmart and Meyer. We know that our residents desire going there. We don't verify residency when people are booking trips. Um, there's no way for us to know if it's an Emmett Township resident versus a Battle Creek City I'm, resident. I'm more concerned with picking up people in Battle Creek and not picking them up in Emmett to take them there. My point. Yes. Are we going to Emmett and picking these people up? And, like, well, if you, you take a BC Go trip to Emmett and go do something in Emmett, and it kind of seems like we would still want that service to be there. Like if we're allowing people from Battle Creek to go to Emmett and Penfield, then we want them to be able to be picked up. And since we don't have the capability to determine if they're residents, and I think right now we need to do a little bit more discussion or leave that alone for right now at this meeting um, until we can get some more information on that. 
See where you're coming from, though, I because you know if we have priorities that are city centric, right? Yeah, and you know those presumably the the priority over peripheral type of services, but I think it's so baked in, as Mallory said, it's so baked in, people will probably lose their minds, you know, if we preemptively cut it off. Mallory, would it be fair to say too that the the stops in Penfield, Emmett, etc. Are the destinations that the city riders want to go to? There aren't additional bus stops necessarily in Springfield. There are certainly correct, but there's not a lot of that. It's not like we're picking up a lot of those folks and bringing them to other correct. I would say Penfield probably has the most bus stops uh, within their township outside of the city limits. Um, Emmett has some of the major destinations like Harper Village, um, Walmart, Meyer. Um, and I'm not even going to include like fire keepers because fire keepers is BC go. If we just look at our fixed route and teletransit area, teletransit is where it begins to get blurry because we are required by law to provide that door to door service three quarters of a mile from every bus stop. So if we have a bus stop at Walmart or Meyer, three quarters of a mile from that is an Emmett Township resident who is now becoming eligible for a city funded service because we're required by law to provide that. Does, does that make sense? It does, um, but that's a bus stop, a, a drop off location. I'm, I guess I'm talking more of, um, I understand Myers is important and, and that, but I'm, I'm talking about, do we have specific stops that we go to Emmett Township like we do on Willard Avenue? In, in the city of Battle Creek? Emmett Township, not as many. Mm -hmm. um, or Penfield. Penfield, yes. Springfield, I'm not worried about. They're the city. I'm, I'm, I'm coming from a back way of looking at it that you don't want to belong to TAC, then why are we servicing you? And uh, so Penfield, we we go to Family Fair mm -hmm. in, in Penfield, um, that mall there. Um, there's some stops coming back in uh, Northeast Capitol that we service that are in Penfield. Um, and then, of course, like I said, the three quarter mile buffer around that. that but you don't Penfield have a specific um, State Street and Main Street type thing in Penfield that you go to. You're going to a destination like Family Fair. No, nope, they're along they're along Northeast Capitol. There's stops along, along Northeast Capitol. Yep. In Penfield. Correct. That's my point. But but again, those those are around your Northeast Capital route, Correct. which is out, headed out to yes. Family Fair. Yes, that's the end in. destination is Family Fair on that route. And so the bus stops at stops along Northeast Capital with its final destination being Family Fair. And that's a big destination, right? Yes. I guess I'm just trying to push, and, and we can move on, but I'm just trying to make the point that if they're not going to belong to TAC, I don't think we should be servicing them in this other way. Yeah, well, I, I don't agree. Think... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Pardon me. Okay. No, I agree um, that if they don't want to belong, then we should possibly look at changing some yeah. of the services. But as far as this route here, it seems like it's more so servicing people who want to use the areas and Penfield from Battle Creek. For example, me personally, I use that family fair quite often because it's the closest sure. to our neighborhood, the closest big grocery store instead of having to go out to Meyer or Walmart. Mm -hmm. And so if I was a person who had to ride the bus, I would much prefer going to family fair over there instead of having to take more time going to right. Walmart or Meyer. And I, I don't have any problem with somebody in the city doing that. I'm talking about the people along the way that are yeah, dependent. But how do we determine who those people are? Is what well, we I don't think somebody from the city of Battle Creek is going to walk to a Penfield bus stop. Well, if it's on Northeast Capitol, then if I was coming from Verona Elementary School as a teacher, then I would go right there. And now, just a block away, now I'm in Penfield, technically. Mm -hmm. gotcha. gotcha. Okay. Also, too, uh, the TAC isn't, isn't any of it. You know, it's a paper organization now. It's not actually administering anything yet because I think they have to shut it. We will, we won't be oh, able to correct. Go straight prohibited to do such a thing once the tag is in place. Yeah. But I think now it's not to the point yet where it's actually doing anything to that authority yet. And I, I would agree. I, I wouldn't say that the city we should take that action just yet no. because we are 
the city of Battle Creek Transit, right? The TAC is its own entity that will create its own boundaries. We are not the TAC. Um, we will operate services on behalf of the TAC, but um, we have our existing boundaries that the city has already set. I'm not saying that we shouldn't evaluate um, or ask Penfield to contribute or ask Emmett Township to contribute. Um, we've had recent conversations with the city of Springfield about uh, their contribution to transit. So I'm not saying those conversations shouldn't be happening mm -hmm. in the meantime so that they are coming to the table to, to pay for services that are in their, their area and benefiting their residents. I think that might be the solution that fixes what you're looking for rather than cutting off service altogether until we get to that step of the, the tech. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, can I just call a, a point of order? I know I'm just uh, in here filling in for Marcel, who normally does a fantastic job. And I got some notes, Commissioner, from you in regarding to working with Mallory, trying to figure out uh, some of the issues with regarding the CDL training and what we can do to enforce it. But I want to call a point of order because it seems like we're getting more into like the member comment section. We're still on action, uh, action item number three, which was a uh, proposition that uh, we eliminate the Saturday services and the midnight services uh, because we're coming up on 12 months pursuant to our resolution. We have to do that. Do we have uh, anyone who is going to move on that? And is there going to be support for that? And then we can circle back to some of the other issues that the mission might have uh, further down with uh, number seven, if that makes sense. Just keep things on track. I'll make the motion. Yeah. Support. Been moved and supported. Is there any comments from the commission in regard to specifically three before there's a vote? I do. Go ahead. Uh, we spoke to sort of that framework and making sure that people understand the reason why we're making this decision and not that it's something that we want to do with something that's already happening and we have to um, get the right language in so that we can continue receiving funds. And I just would like that to be reflected. Absolutely. I will... Um... I will work with you guys closely. We'll start the public pro uh, public process like we did with the fare increase. We internally will take care of all of that. And then I will be at that meeting where the commission will formally approve that resolution. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? I'll vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Been moved and supported. <laughs> uh, Mallory, if you want to move on to four. Thank you. Um, so we discussed last at the last PTC meeting um, that we had been approached by the city of Marshall um, truly back in 2019 initially, and then COVID hit and everything kind of slowed down. Um, but again, recently last year about assuming administrative roles for the city of Marshall's transit services. And um, through uh, the attorney's office and the city manager's office for both the city of Marshall and the city of Battle Creek, we've developed an agreement. It will have a contract manager essentially placed. It's a Battle Creek Transit employee that will be placed at the city of Marshall dial -a ride offices and will oversee the day-to-day -day operations of Marshall dial -a ride services. Now, this is happening in conjunction with a separate grant that we had talked about last year when we received phase three of our BC Go um, pilot. So we received $500,000 last year to expand BC Go and to partner with Marshall as our, as our collaborating agency on um, licensing out our BC Go software. So um, that is separate, but also part of this agreement and how we're gonna braid those two fundings together. Um, so that we can do this cost neutrally. Um, there will be a, a resolution on the agenda, the commission agenda next week, approving the city manager to, to enter into that agreement. And then we have extended an offer to a Battle Creek Transit employee who will be housed over there. So I, um, I wanted to present that to you guys and it is in your agenda packets for the commission meeting, but answer any questions you might have about that agreement. Is the BC Go software like proprietary? It was created here. Uh, so we partnered it? with a technology firm out of Australia, and they pretty much built it from the ground up with Christy. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, 
they've since taken that and duplicated it in other cities um, and mostly private industry. So for example, they're running it in like Amazon, Nike, Nike. those campuses. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we were their first US client and we got a pretty steep discount for for piloting. Yeah. That's awesome. Even three years later. Yep. Yeah, even three <laughs> years later, they still don't charge us very much. Yep. Into that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? yeah. Yeah. They, we use, it's a mutually beneficial relationship. Mm -hmm. They, uh, they put together some really good graphics and marketing materials for us. And, and we let them use our data in some of their reports and sales materials, but yeah. Yeah. So ideally the city of Marshall, um, will slowly, um, their community might have a different adaptation to the technology than ours did. And so the city of Marshall will slowly roll out some BC Go um, hours of service, zones of service, and then technology. And who did we recommend the city of Marshall contract to the city commission? Second. Moved and supported. Is there any further discussion from the commission? All those in favor? Aye. Uh, passes. Thank you. Okay, uh, so the last thing I have is just review and discussion of the TAC, um, Transit Authority of Calhoun County. Um, this isn't an action item, just discussion and opportunity to ask questions, provide comments. We um, have a copy of revised articles of incorporation. So the I believe the county just adopted those last night, um, which reduced the number of uh, positions on the board from nine to seven because uh, two of those positions were meant for villages and townships. The tech boundaries are the four cities of Battle Creek, Springfield, Marshall, and Albion. And um, the board will now reflect that. The city still has two seats on that board. Um, the county has two seats on that board and then each of the other cities has a seat. Um, so I just wanted to open up an opportunity for questions, um, clarifications. Is there anything that we can do to, um, I guess, alleviate some any concerns about the tech? Do we have revised figures on considering the four cities now? Um, do we have revised figures on the good, better, best proposed millage rates? I am working on that. I do not have those yet. Yep. Um, so it would impact both the level of service that was initially proposed and the revenue. So I'm working on what that would look like. Mm -hmm. I will share when we did the, the four cities and three townships, I believe it was, right? Bedford, Emmett, and Penfield. When we had considered opt-in of that, um, it was about 1.3 to 1.5 mils. So we're still hovering around that one point, I'm going to say on average 1.3 mils. Um, but I haven't, I haven't proposed a, a different scenario. Valerie, yeah, should we assume that county is still on the same timeline too, as it relates to appointing the board, which I think they plan to do with their November 16th meeting. Correct. Separate? And there's a reason that that timeline is important. So our state and federal funding is a year ahead. So right now we're in calendar year 23. We're working in fiscal year 24, and then we're applying for fiscal year 25. So um, those applications for fiscal year 25 funding, which starts October 1 of 2024, um, those applications are due by February 1st. So we have a pretty short turnaround time for the TAC to be able to appoint a board, approve a budget, or even a, a, a temporary budget, we can make revisions to that budget all the way up until August, um, and then get that information off to the state and the feds. In the event that a millage passes and people approve this and say, yeah, let's start service, um, we wanna be able to start service. We don't wanna say we have to wait a year to be able to start collecting our state and federal funding because we didn't apply for it. So that's that's part of why that timeline is so crunched. It Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, no. Yeah, I was just gonna say, and and then you're gonna apply on behalf of the city. The TAC will apply, but we're also uh, applying by on behalf of the city. Yes. To support so, our normal operations, should that not come to fruition. Yes, the city of Marshall will still complete their normal application like they would. The city of Battle Creek will complete their application like we normally would, and then the TAC will complete an application. 
So if the millage fails, then we we fall back on our applications that we submitted. If the TAC passes, then that funding would be passed through to the TAC. So from a legal perspective, what happens under the circumstances which your TAC is created, vested authority, but then the millage fails and has no money? Um, as you know, I'm skeptical. Um, but if it if it does fail once it reaches the ballot, but the the actual administrative infrastructure of the TAC and its authority are there, what does that look like? And I wish I could answer that question off the top of my head. As you know, I'm not the attorney who's normally on this board who handles these issues. I handle yeah. the, the lawsuits, but this wasn't a specific class in law school. <laughs> it was not. Uh, I can give you a guess today, which I not comfortable with doing, but That's I could okay. actually get you the actual Ooh, answer okay. and yeah. then send you an email about Please. that. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, let me, is any one else from the commission interested in, in yeah, answering that question? To me as well. I will send it to the group. Thank you. Yes. Anecdotally, I will share with you uh, that that has happened. So uh, the RTA um, in Daniel? Oakland, Wayne McComb. Yeah, Oakland, Wayne, Macomb, Washtenaw, Monroe. Monroe. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so the RTA failed like three times. Yeah, they were years. Yes. Um, but the RTA still existed and in fact still had like a CEO, still had people behind the scenes who were working to for the next millage and the next ballot proposal. Oh. Yes. <laughs> um, and they were still collecting operating assistance from the state. Now their millage failed, but they still existed as a body. And those other transit providers in Washtenaw, which has multiple providers, um, Wayne, those all still operated as normal. Um, Oakland County just recently passed their millage after several years of trying as well. No. And their authority yeah. existed separately. Yes. So there's a potential then, and this might be the best point to, to chew on, you know, how we react to such a thing. There's potential that the TAC board could be formed and, you know, filled with non-compensated board members. That's fine. Mm -hmm. We might potentially incur costs at some point once that body starts to create costs, potentially through staffing or legal contracting, et cetera, mm -hmm. but has no money. And we're going to have to deal with, you know, who among the four of us are going to split those bills. So we've applied for a grant. Uh, it's called Rural, Rural and Tribal Assistance Program. Um, we've requested three hundred and twenty thousand dollars to cover those costs that may incur. Okay, great. Um, you figure you're going to need somebody who's going to write policies, procedures, okay. all of your federally required like ADA uh, compliance, Title VI compliance, all of those things, plus negotiate leases, people vehicles, all of that kind of stuff between all of the existing bodies. So um, there was conversation previously amongst the cities um, already as that kind of steering committee or, or stakeholder group that had been talking about this um, on how that might get divided if the cities had to pay for it. But we've applied for that grant and we should hear any time now if that was successful. Separately, we've applied for a grant for startup capital. So we put in a request to Senator Peter's office um, for congressionally directed spending uh, for, I believe we are currently in the line item for 1.5 million in startup capital. Great, it's great to hear that and that's like forward thinking. On yes. It. I just don't wanna get a mess where all of a sudden this thing starts the last getting thing, dead. Right, the last thing we want is the TAC to get approved, the military to get approved, and then us to say we don't have funds sure, or people sure. or vehicles to operate it. Um, and so we're, in that sense, we're trying to be proactive on what that would look like. Yeah. I'm just more concerned about half, you know, we built a tag, but then the vehicle for funding the tag, the millages mm -hmm. don't come through. So, but it sounds like you're not, so that's great. Thanks. Yes. Yes. A question came up, or comment came up in regards to dial a ride for uh, Marshall, which I'm familiar with, that Harbor have dial a ride. Is that something that will go away if they, if the tag goes through? Yes. So really the only, um, and, and Marshall understands that as well. Um, I guess at least Marshall leadership understands that. I'm not sure it's been communicated to the public the same way. Um, Marshall dial -a ride will be absorbed by the TAC. 
similarly to us, technically we would, our funding sources and everything will be absorbed by the TAC, but the TAC right now, because we have so such robust capital people experience, the TAC intends to pass those dollars through to the city to operate the service. If that was not the intent, then we would be in the same position as Marshall. Yeah. Isn't isn't Dialeride the same basically as BC Go? Dialeride is similar to our teletransit. More like teletransit. More like so Dialeride is they call. Um, so a person calls the office, says I have a doctor's appointment on Tuesday. Can you get me there? And they send out a vehicle. Yeah. It is similar to BC Go, it just doesn't have the technology component. Gotcha. But it will because it will the grant. Yep. So <laughs> part of that agreement is that um they'll start licensing some of that technology from us. So it'll be more like BC Go. I don't, I don't want to get too far off the pace, but what happens with those buses and stuff that they have? That Marshall has? Those would all be assumed by the, the assumed. attack. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Marshall also has a dedicated village for transportation. They do. do yep. It's about 0. 0.9 mills okay. that their residents already pay for transportation services. So their increase would only, for TAC, would go from 0. 0.9 to 1, whatever we Correct. decide. Correct. Tag the sides. Correct. Or go down. Be easier for them <laughs> down. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> yeah. So um, all of the capital that exists, both with the city and with the city of Marshall, is um, federally funded. So those federal assets would go to whoever is the federally funded operator, um, unless those vehicles have met their useful life, which Marshalls have not. So that raises an interesting question, Mallory, then it, the, the federal agencies, the federal state agencies that are looking at funding the authority, are they going to, they're not going to do that unless the authority can demonstrate that it has a solid or ongoing source of funding, right? Such as a millage. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So um, you, we sign every year, we have, we do our certifications and assurances, they're called, Jill reads through all like 110 pages every year. Um, and they are basically us certifying that we have the funds to match whatever the stipulation requires. So for example, our operating assistance that we get from the feds, it requires a 50% match. So they give us a million dollars, we have to match it with a million dollars. Um, our capital is an 80-20. They give us 80% of the cost, we have to come up with 20% of the cost. That 20% for us right now comes from the state of Michigan, the state covers that 20%, so we don't have we don't have any cost invested in our capital, um, but we sign off every year saying that we we have the funds to meet our federal obligations. And the TAC would have to do the same thing. If it doesn't have a millage, the TAC can't certify and assure, and so they would not be able to receive funding. What happens to, so the labor agreements we have are between the union and the city. Mm -hmm. And the TAC gets formed and you know, millage proof, all, all of that. What happens to those labor agreements? Are they automatically pushed to the tax somehow, or is it a brand new labor agreement that needs to be? It's a combination of both. Uh, Public Act 196 actually outlines specifically what happens with existing contracts and um, requires that we honor existing contracts or renegotiate contracts that are near expiration. So, um, the city or the TAC? The, the TAC. Okay. So, okay. Um, otherwise the city employees wouldn't be impacted right now. They're all represented employees. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the tax passes through, we operate, they'd continue at their, under their existing collective bargaining agreement. If they were to become employees of the TAC, then the TAC would be required to honor those existing collective bargaining agreements or renegotiate similar ones. And that's all within the legislative language of public act 196 which is what that authority was formed under. But again, right now their intent would be to contact with the city and thus the, the bargaining agreements between the city and right. the state employees. Yes. But again, that's also the, 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 the board, the TAC board would have that final decision. Yes. It's mostly the planning group that has said, hey, this is the way we want to operate. Yes. Are there any other questions about the TAC that I can answer or where everything is at? Um, we're in the board appointment phase right now um, with that deadline being um, us getting the information to the county by November 8th so that they can get it on their November 16th agenda. And um, from there, 
we're planning a pretty tight turnaround of meeting, um, planning a kind of transit 101, um, because I imagine some of these cities that don't, don't have transportation currently is going to be a foreign concept to them, especially some of the funding mechanisms and things like the labor agreements and capital purchasing, stuff like that. So um, we are trying to schedule a transit 101, a board orientation, and then start working on what service area, service hours, all of that looks like. Mayor, I have I have nothing else. If... So we're on to public comments. Is there any one from the public that we can hear comments from via online? No. All right. Uh, circling back to uh, the general discussion by the, the commission here. I know two of you were expressing uh, some questions uh, pertaining to servicing in other cities and outside of our jurisdiction. Uh, if you want to circle back to that conversation now, would be the appropriate time to ask like follow up questions and all that. Those things. I'll just make a comment about um, Penfield Township. One of the trustees um, who owns Family Fair Plaza. Um, was very instrumental in preventing Penfield from becoming a member of the countywide transportation. And he said, why should we have to pay for their transportation? So that's the type of mentality we're dealing with. And mm -hmm. He's, you know, receiving uh, through rent, a lot of the uh, citizens who go out to family fair. It's unfortunate, but that's how they think. <laughs> And we've presented to, to every township and, and village that would have us. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing I tried to leave them with was that the people who rely on public transportation to get to those meetings aren't here because public transportation doesn't exist, right? So unless you're actively seeking the comments from people who are using public transportation and you're going to them, they don't have a way to get to you because there is no transportation. Mm -hmm. So... I'm disappointed in how that turned out, but hopefully in five years, it'll be different. Yep. Okay. I did have one question. Um, is there three different transportation boards or is there just TAC and the, the uh, PT, uh, PTC? So the there are within Battle Creek Transit, we have the LAC, which is our local advisory council. The LCC, which is our local coordinating committee, and then the PTC. This is the PTC. Um, it consists of commissioners. The LCC, the local coordinating committee, ex uh, consists of public transportation providers in the area. So for us, that's Battle Creek Transit, Community Action Agency, uh, Community Inclusive Recreation, CIR, and Marion Birch Adult Day Center. Um, we have invited others. We put out a public notice of uh, notice of funding opportunity to others who would like to participate in that group. And the objective of that group is to divide our specialized services funding um, amongst all of the providers. The LAC is the local advisory council. They advise on vehicle accessibility. So that is, um, let's say we wanted to order a an SUV or a sedan that wasn't accessible. Um, so it didn't have a wheelchair securement location, they would need to approve that. They would need to say, how are you going to show us that somebody with a disability can get equitable service? All of our vehicles are accessible, so we don't have to worry about that part. But we have quarterly meetings with them to update our vehicle accessibility plan as we expand our fleet. So, And then our annual application for funding requires that the LAC signs off on that application if we're requesting capital. So just to make sure that they've had a chance to review the vehicles we intend to purchase and that they agree those are accessible um, and we provide equitable service to everybody in the community. The TAC is gonna be totally separate, its own governing body, and that will have its own boards and separate committees. Thank you. You're welcome. I move that we adjourn. Okay. Thank you guys. I will keep you updated on the um you got your answer. Public notice the public notice and public participation yeah, process and then when that'll be on the commission. Yeah.